Appreciate Joe leading verse 2 of uh, our hymn just a moment ago, referencing the joy in heaven, not only having a mansion, but a robe and a crown. In the Olympics, the winners were given laurel crowns, wreaths made out of this particular uh, tree leaves, and they were given to these winners, and, and it represented victory. And I want to talk to you this morning, just for a few minutes, about how often this term is found in the New Testament, and the times where it's brought up, how it describes not only the sense of victory, but also what we have to do to be able to obtain it. We're all here this morning, at least I, I hope we're all here this morning, because not only do we want to praise God and to worship Him, but because we also we want to get to heaven. And we love God because He first loved us. We love Jesus because He sacrificed His life for us. And we're here because we want one day to be able to receive a crown of victory. But what's interesting is in the New Testament, there's a couple different terms for crown. There's a term used exclusively in Revelation, diadema, which is the crown of a king. And it is used within Revelation describing this, this crown of authority, this crown of a kingship. And it's used in different ways, but it's, it's always used regarding either God or, or kings of the earth, that sort of thing. But when it comes to you and me, when it comes to the component of this crown of victory that we will receive one day, if we remain faithful, we find this term actually take place a lot or several, on several occasions in the New Testament. The first one I want to look at with you this morning is in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 6. As Paul writes to Timothy, this is his last letter to Timothy as far as we know before Paul is, is killed because of his faith. We see in verse 6, he tells Timothy, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Then in verse 8, he says, Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Notice Paul references in verse 7 the fact that he fought the good fight, he's finished the race. Both of these, uh, whether you're talking about gladiatorial fights, you're talking about Olympic races, obviously Paul's using this in a figurative way to show his spiritual fight, his spiritual race, and then he says, I've kept the faith. But in both of these instances of verse 7, where he describes the fight and the race, the winners of those fights and races would be given a crown of victory. And it is this crown that he refers to in verse 8. He says, finally, there is laid up for me. But notice Paul doesn't just call it a crown of victory. He calls it the crown of righteousness. And I think context, given the backdrop of what all is taking place in, in Paul's life at this moment, is part of the reason why he uses this, this adjective or this phrase, crown of righteousness. Because obviously Paul is going to have victory. But Paul says this crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge. Keep in mind, this is in contrast to Paul being judged and executed because of his faith. That would be an unrighteous judge of the earth, Caesar, condemning him to death because of his faith. In contrast to the unrighteous judgment of the world, of the flesh, Paul's looking forward to the righteous judgment of the one who makes no mistakes, of the only one who can define right and wrong, the righteous judge, the Lord. And Paul will be given on that day a crown of righteousness. What that means is, is this crown, yes, it represents victory. But it also represents, in contrast to the judgment of man, which condemned Paul for his faith, the judgment of God, and at judgment, it's going to be Jesus on the judgment seat, the judgment of the Lord is that this one was right in my sight. 
And there's a term here that Paul doesn't use, yet the subtext is there. And it's justified. Paul will be justified on that day. That despite the injustice he faced in this world, he will receive the justice and acclamation of, you did what was right. I declare, before all Jesus will do, I declare you have done what was right. This crown of righteousness will not only be given to Paul, but to all those who do what is right in the sight of God. Regardless of what man says, regardless of what Caesar or kingdom says, doing what, the, what is right in the sight of Jehovah, in the sight of the Lord Jesus, that is what justifies. And that is what will provide a crown of righteousness. But notice the component here that Paul says how he is going to achieve this. He says, I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Well, in fighting those fights and in finishing the race, Paul, he followed the rules. He submitted to what was, he was told to do. He did it with all his might. He f- ran that race. He fought that fight, as he mentions in 1 Corinthians 9, Not as one who beats the air, but Paul was certain in the things that he did because of what God's word told him. And as a result, Paul says, I have kept the faith. Only those who, like Paul, fight the good fight, finish the race, and keep the faith to the end will, like Paul, receive a crown of righteousness. Another time we see this term used is in 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5, this is a context in which Peter is speaking to fellow elders. Now, elders, these are individuals that are referenced in the New Testament. There's three different terms that describe the same office. There's the office of the elder, bishop, or pastor. Okay, a lot of times our society uses the the term pastor to describe the preacher, the evangelist, the minister. But in the New Testament, the term pastor is related, it's the concept of pastoral, one who guards and leads. That's applied to the elders, these who lead the sheep, those who lead the flock of God, uh, the people of God's people. Well, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 5, he says in verse 2, he encourages these co-elders, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, verse 3, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. He describes the attitude that elders are to serve, and he says not as being lords over those, that describes the attitude. It's not that the elders bishops, pastors, it's all the same thing. Not that they didn't have authority, they did. But they weren't to exercise that authority as if they were lords to be served. Instead, they were to be doing the serving because they were to be an example to the rest of the brethren. And then in verse 4, Paul, uh, Peter says, when the chief shepherd, that is Jesus, when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now, I suggest to you, obviously, Peter's speaking specifically to elders here, those who hold the office of an elder. But that the same crown that Peter talks about is the same exact crown that Paul talks about in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The crown that Paul referred to as the crown of righteousness, given the context of unrighteousness that was condemning Paul to death, Peter, in this context, describing the office that these elders are to uphold, the character that they're to carry, the example they're to set, that when that day comes and the Lord returns, the reward they will receive is a crown of glory. Now, the concept of glory carries with it the idea of exaltation. That's what the crown of glory is is being used, that phrase is being used to represent that exaltation. You will receive that crown of exaltation. You have served in a difficult capacity. Being Being an elder is not an easy task. And you served, you were faithful in that service, you provided the example you were supposed to provide, and you will be exalted as a result. 
And while Peter certainly is speaking to elders here, I believe that same crown will be given to all those who are faithful. All those who serve faithfully. Elders don't get a special crown. Evangelists don't get another special crown. All brethren, all Christians who serve faithfully will be exalted by the Lord. They will receive a crown of glory. Next place I want to consider is James chapter 1. James chapter 1, notice with me, starting in verse, starting in verse 10. I'm start in verse 9. James chapter 1, verse 9. James, he's just finished describing the fact that, uh, that uh, let patience have its perfect work. Those who lack wisdom should pray. God gives to all men liberally. He describes kind of the, the ways of, of uh, faith and how that if, you're, if you doubt, you're kind of like a, a, a double, double, uh, uh, double-minded man, verse 8. But then in verse 9, he says, let the lowly brother, this is one who is humble. This is one who doesn't exalt himself, but rather is going to let God exalt him. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, that is, in God uplifting you. But the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. Now, James isn't describing that being rich or wealthy in this world is in any way sinful. It's always combined with the character of individuals who trust in their riches versus those who trust in God, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. But what Paul or what James here, verse 9 and 10, describes is the contrast of one who is humble, who trusts only in God, versus the rich man who trusts in his riches and not in God. How that the humble brother will be glorified, God will exalt him, but the rich man who trusts only in his wealth... He will be humiliated. God will bring him down. Verse, 10, or verse 11, rather. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls, and so its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Notice what's being described here. The pursuits of the rich man. The one who only has the desire for riches in his heart. He describes how that he will be withered away. That's not lasting. That's not eternal. But then verse 12, here's the contrast. Here's the flip back to verse 9 about the lowly brother. Blessed is the man, verse 12, who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And again, sometimes verse 12, it's as if it starts a separate context. I don't believe that's the case. James has a great deal to talk about regarding those who are rich in this life and whose character is one that is only focused on the riches. He talks a great deal throughout these chapters about those who desire the physical things of this world versus those who desire only to please God. Well, as it pertains to enduring temptation... Overcoming obstacles, verse 12. What did he say earlier in, in chapter 1, in verse 2? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. He's still in that same vein of thought. He now moves on to describe, blessed is that man who, when he fell into various trials and temptations, counted it as joy to be tried and tested and was willing to endure. Blessed is that man, for when he is approved, that means that when he has come through all of his trials, and that approval then comes from the Lord, he's been tested, and now he's, been, he's come out showing that he is truly a, a servant of, of God. He will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now, when he describes the crown of life, that's in contrast to the rich man who in this life might have the means, the funds to live it up how he wants. He may enjoy a prosperous life in the flesh, he may enjoy all the pleasures that the world has to offer. But as we pointed out, verse 10 and 11, 
that withers away. That will not last. Whereas the lowly brother, the one who is submissive to Jehovah, the one who is humble in his approach to life, he will receive a crown that doesn't fade away. Riches that are eternal as opposed to passing. A life that will live forever in heaven in paradise as opposed to torment. But it's only given to those who love the Lord. And I think that's important to note that in, this, in the context that James is describing, this rich man doesn't love the Lord. What does he love? He loves his riches. And ultimately, we can claim we love God all we want to, but it is our conduct that shows whether or not we truly love God. If we truly love God, Jesus says in John chapter 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But in this situation, the rich man, he doesn't love God. Regardless, I mean, and James is not suggesting that he says he does, but even posit that, that maybe he even claims that he does. Yet in his life, in his actions, in his conduct, his pursuit for wealth overrides everything else. He's not humble. He doesn't care about God's commandments. He seeks only to do what he wants. In Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 10, Revelation chapter 2 and in verse 10, once again we have another time where this term crown of life is used. And this time it's to the church at Smyrna. And Revelation 2, Jesus, he writes this letter to the church at Smyrna. He says in verse 9, in fact, Smyrna is one of the, the few where nothing bad is said about this congregation. Only good is, is commended towards these brethren. And it's all because of the fact that they are enduring great suffering and persecution, and yet they are being faithful despite it all. He says in verse 9, I know your works, the tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. This term poverty doesn't just mean poor. Okay? It doesn't mean just barely getting by paycheck to paycheck. This term poverty literally means destitute. They have Nothing. And I think it's interesting, just the, the parallel from James 1, that the same context in which James uses that phrase, crown of life, Jesus uses the same phrase to a group of people who aren't just poor and lowly, they are destitute. They've got nothing. And yet Jesus says, but you are rich. They may be poor, they may be destitute in the flesh, but in the spirit, it's the exact opposite this term rich is, is the term used for overabounding wealth. Or overabounding wealth. You are rich. In the spirit, they have everything. I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Verse 10, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. The, the interesting parallel or contrast really here between these two phrases that he's describing. These brethren who are facing death, brethren who are facing persecution, who are facing trial and tribulation. And yet Jesus says, I'm going to give you life if you're willing to be faithful unto death, if you're willing to be faithful unto physical death, I will give you eternal life. And that's the beautiful component of this, that Jesus says be faithful unto death. Even to the point where your faith directly is, or is directly responsible for your being killed, I will give you a crown of life. While in the flesh, they were being disqualified. In the flesh, they were being cast aside. While in the flesh, people of their society might have considered them losers. Jesus is going to give them a crown that represents victory. And it is a victory of eternal life. 
What's interesting is, and all these phrases, both in 2 Timothy 4, 1 Peter 5, James 1, Revelation 2, it's a crown of, crown of righteousness, crown of glory, crown of life. And even within those contexts, we see what this crown represents. The spiritual beauty of this crown representing God saying, you were right, you did what I said, what I asked you to do. This glory, this exaltation, this eternal life, despite whatever physical situation you may face. But there's also some other components contained within this as well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and in verse 25, Paul writes to these brethren in 1 Corinthians 9, and he's in a context of yielding himself so that the gospel may be taught. He says earlier in verse 20, he says, or starting in verse 19, he says, Though I am free from all men, I, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win the more. In verse 22, he says, I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Paul is in a context of 1 Corinthians 9 of representing what the links that he was willing to go to in order to save souls, to teach the gospel. Verse 23, I do this for the gospel's sake, that I might be a partaker of it with you. When Paul says partaker, he's referring to the reward, the home in heaven, that I will be able to partake of the promises, of the hope of the gospel, which is eternal life. Verse 24, do you not know that those who run in a race all, all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Paul's not saying that there's only one crown to win. He's saying run as if there were. He's using the analogy of running in the races of the Olympics in Greece and receiving that laurel wreath, that crown, showing the victory. Verse 25, everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things, but they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Paul directly recognizes the, the victory crown that these runners receive when they win a race, but it's just leaves. It's what it represents, certainly, that is important, but it is a perishable crown. It, it, it dries up. It withers away. Paul says the crown that we are running this race for is imperishable. It's incorruptible. It doesn't fade away. Verse 26, therefore, this is the way I run. I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight as a gladiatorial warrior, not as one who beats the air. I'm trained. I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm fighting for, and I know why I'm running. Verse 27. But what's necessary, Paul? Just like with all these other contexts, we see those who love the Lord. We see, like with 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, those who finished the course, those who kept the faith. Paul says in verse 27, I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. It's beautiful the links that Paul takes this analogy. Just as athletes and fighters try to keep their, their top physical shape as they train to be the fastest runner or the strongest and most disciplined fighter, Paul says, I discipline my body, not in the physical sense of training for a race, but in the sense of submitting himself to God's will, of keeping himself from sin, I bring my body into subjection. Into subjection to what? Well, the, the runners and the fighters, they may have a, a, a health regimen they follow. They may have an exercise regimen. Paul, he brings it into subjection to the rule of God, to the gospel. Lest, after he's preached to others, he's taught others how to train themselves to get to heaven, that he is disqualified from his own race of getting to heaven. In Revelation chapter 3, and in verse 11, 
another church that Jesus writes to in Revelation 2 and 3, this time to the church at Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia is also a notable congregation because it's the other church about whom nothing bad is said. But here in Revelation 3 and in verse 11, after Jesus references the works of these brethren, after he references this as the fact that these brethren have not denied his name, despite, again, this synagogue of Satan, these Jews who claim to be Jews but aren't, he says, indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet. Verse 10, because you've kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Remember, Revelation is being written before the fall of Rome. And all of the, these brethren that are in these places of Asia Minor, these in, entire cities are going to be decimated as the Roman Empire falls. All of Revelation is about that judgment coming upon the Roman Empire. This hour that is to test the whole world ultimately represented the fall of society. Verse 11, Behold, Jesus says, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now, in every other scripture we've noticed, it's always looking ahead to Judgment Day, looking ahead to the Lord's return, where this crown will be given to those who are faithful. But notice Jesus, he speaks as if these brethren already have it. And in a sense, they do, they have it reserved. There is a crown waiting for every one of those brethren because of their faith, their willingness to submit even to the point of being beaten and killed for their faith. They had a crown waiting. He says, hold fast what you have. Hold fast to your faith. Hold fast to your conviction. Hold fast to your willingness to, to be beaten and killed for the Lord's name. That no one may take your crown. You have a crown. It's waiting for you. It's yours. All you have to do is hold fast. That was the condition Jesus described to them. Hold fast. Be firm. Be strong. Don't yield, even for a moment, the truth of God's word and your submission to it. That crown is as good as yours. Now, these are just some of the patterns. There's other places in the, in the New Testament where this term Stephanos is found, which represents this laurel wreath, this crown of victory. But I think it's notable that in Greek society, there were three ways, three notable times in which this crown is found in the society of, of Greek and Roman uh, life. The first one we've talked about already. The fact that in the Olympic Games, athletes who overcame the obstacles and were victorious in their races, and you could even include that the gladiatorial fights who received the crown of victory. But they overcame their obstacles and as a result were victorious. The second, however, and this is more specific to the church at Smyrna in Revelation 2, it's notable that in Smyrna, a laurel wreath, a crown, a Stephanos, was awarded to those citizens of Smyrna who were deemed to have been exemplary in faithful municipal service. The government would award a victory crown to those who showed basically civil service in their service to Smyrna and the citizens of Smyrna. And then... The third way in which this term is found in Greek culture was that laurel wreaths were also worn at marriages and other joyous occasions. This is the three ways in which this term is used, even outside of the Bible, outside of the New Testament, just in Greek culture. This is where we find people of that day and how they used 
this victory wreath, this victory crown. But I want you to note the underlined portions of these. And then look back on these scriptures that we've considered. And consider the application that Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the writing of the New Testament want us to take from this. Yes, we talk about the crown of righteousness, the crown of glory, the crown of life. Yes, we talk about the, the, the crown that is incorruptible, it's imperishable. We talk about the crown that is reserved and waiting at the church of Philadelphia. This crown of life in Revelation 2 and verse 10, the church at Smyrna, it's interesting that that might have had, it, had an added uh, meaning for them. Because not only would they have been aware of the crown as a victory, not only would they have been aware of the crown as being worn at a joyous occasion, but also a crown for faithful service in Smyrna. And so the question for us this morning is, are we willing to overcome the obstacles in our race to heaven, in our fight to get to heaven, fight against corruption, fight against sin, the, the, the wiles of the devil, the, the fiery darts that he throws at us? Are we willing to overcome the obstacles to receive that crown of victory? Are we willing to commit ourselves to faithful service, both to the Lord, to our brethren, and to our fellow neighbor? Being one who is here to serve, not to be served. Are we willing to live in such a way that when judgment day comes, when the Lord returns to redeem the faithful, that that would be a joyous occasion. That on that joyous occasion, the welcoming in of all of God's people to that glorious mansion that he has prepared for us, that we too would receive that invitation, have a crown of joy placed on our head, and be ushered in to the joy of our Lord. If you're not living a way in which you would receive such a crown this morning, consider your soul's state. If you're not a Christian this morning, you can be baptized to have your sins washed away, and you too, committing yourself to faithful service, can have a crown of life reserved for you. For those of us who are Christians... There's a reason why we're supposed, to, we're supposed to put on the helmet of salvation in Ephesians 6. In the equipment of the, the Christian soldier, that helmet of salvation means that that salvation, home in heaven, is supposed to be at the forefront of our mind. It isn't it interesting that you have the helmet of salvation, but then once this battle is done, once the war has been waged, we substitute that helmet with a crown. But it all is about that home in heaven. Will you submit yourself to that this morning? Do you need help in any way? Come forward as we stand and say. In Matthew chapter 27, starting in verse 24, Matthew records for us that when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was, was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas to them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Then in verse 27, we're told that the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed, struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him, put his clo own clothes back on him and led him away to be crucified. Matthew records for us a horrific scene of the soldiers mocking Jesus. And in the process of mocking Jesus, they mockingly treat him as a king, giving him a reed in his hand as a scepter, putting on a purple robe, which is meant to be representative of royalty. They would kneel before him, 
They'd say, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they would spit on him and beat him. But in addition to all of that, verse 29, they twisted a crown of thorns. It's the same term, Stephanos, as we looked at in our lesson. What was meant to be a crown of victory, a crown of exaltation and glory, these soldiers made a crown of humiliation, a crown of mockery, and a crown of death. For us to consider before we take of the bread and the fruit of the vine this morning is that Jesus wore a crown of humiliation and mockery and death so that you and I could wear a crown of exaltation and hope and life.